Good afternoon. I welcome you all here on behalf of Kozumi Karana Association. I'm just doing local for the secretary of Kozumi Karana Association. We have Dr. Janaksha Urishin today. And Dr. Janaksha is of course part and parcel of GS Medical College, NKM Hospital as a undergraduate and postgraduate student. But what is remarkable about him is that he has gone in 173 surgical missions worldwide doing very humanitarian work over the last 22 years and has conducted more than 25 workshops in international conferences teaching small invasive cataract excision cataract surgery and I invite the best speaker who is my classmate, right from Edwinston College, 1959, 61 to 63, then from here, 63, till we did our post-graduation, and then I went into anatomy and he went into ophthalmology, and till today we remain in touch. And that's what has brought one of other classmates here, Dr. Nasty. Please, Rumi. Sorry, Dr. Jangir. No request for reversals. Sir, Dr. Sunil Panya. And Professor Head of Ophthalmology now, Dr. Sheila Kerka. I would request Neha resident to welcome all of them with flowers. Dr. Ruby Jangir. Dr. Sri Patra. And Dr. Sheila Kerta. This gives us one opportunity since I see here very senior teachers so we would like to just welcome the acknowledge that how we appreciate their presence here. Dr. Ursekar, I remember this was the very podium where every morning he came at 8 o'clock to take ophthalmology sessions for us. I still can't forget very meticulous teaching done by him. The ophthalmology, whatever 13 sessions he was assigned to, he very faithfully did. And I think we all did very well in ophthalmology. Rumi is classical symbol of that. So Dr. Ursekar. Another teacher of mine and Dr. Rumi Jangir. Dr. Adrian Wala is sitting there. Dr. Kamdar is with us. Thank you so much. We appreciate Dr. Nagpur having come here. Hmm? Yeah, that's why. We have Dr. I should say Nagpur, you know, not Nagpur. Dr. Nehrukar, radiologist, yeah. Dr. Silva Hulekar. And we are so happy to have Dr. Rumi Jagis, better half here. Yeah. And we can't forget the main donor because he's the youngest, so that's why we'll felicitate Dr. Janaksha is there. And 
I have it over to you.
in viewing this procedure on the pavements of Kalba Devi by a turbaned guy. He put some cocaine like paste in the eye, took a knitting needle type of rod, put it in his mouth, lubricated it with saliva, pushed it into this patient's eye and thut, he lug out the lens into the vitreous. He immediately showed him two fingers, he could count, and then he disappeared from that scene before end of commentary. <laughs> this was the way things were done earlier. There was local and vocal anesthesia. People were caught, made to drink alcohol, and then the surgery was performed. Even the Bible records that Jesus laid his hands on the eyes of a man and prayed and then he saw men walking as big as trees. Now it is hypothesized that there might have been an element of couching where he has displaced the legs and this is classical description of the aphakic vision which you have without the faking glasses. Things have changed. With the advent of new <coughs> microscopes, instrumentation, gloves have come in now. When we first entered the department, all of us used to operate with bare hands because it was thought that the gloves would dull the sensitivity of the fingers. And when these were made mandatory, people resisted and still continued to operate without gloves. That time the HIV epidemic took place. And I distinctly remember one of our eye surgeons being threatened by his wife. You don't wear gloves, you don't touch me. <laughs> Later on came the intracapsular cataract surgery, extracapsular, small incision as Janak has uh, uh, clearly demonstrated, which is a, as good a procedure as the FACO and microsurgeries. Now the Fento assisted cataract surgery and the lasers are taking over. The first person to remove the cataract was Jacques Davier, and these are some of the primitive instruments. Von Graffi, the father of ophthalmology, and his special knife, we used to love to use the Greisharber knife in those days, was the mainstay of our surgical procedures because with the sharp knife you could take a flap, and even those times we could do sutureless surgeries. The intracapsular for sips was the main thing which was used initially. Dr. Urseka used to use the cross-section castrovijos. If you remove the six o'clock old first, it was known as tumbling. If you got the twelve o'clock and removed it, it was called sliding. I don't know if any of you have seen this, the erisophake. It was like a rubber teat with a hollow tube which produced suction on pressing the rubber and the hypermature cataracts would get stuck through this erisophake and it could be delivered. For lenses which were too slippery to be caught by the forceps. Next came the cryo. The cryo probe would freeze the lens and extract it intracapsularly. All we had to do was see that the cornea and the iris did not get stuck to these things. Barraker was the one who invented chymotrypsin usage for young patients who had very tough zonules. So the zonules would be weakened or dissolved by the use of chymotrypsin which was inserted over the anterior surface of the lens and then the intracapsular surgery was done. 
this was in such short supply that we would bunch up five guys in one day and then do them with alpha chemotrypsin. Initially there were no sutures. The thickest sutures came in as 6-0 silk. Historically, ants have been used in order to oppose the wounds and once they put the, uh, the two edges, the body would be snipped off. Then came tendons, then came even human hair. Dr. Muscati and Dr. Useka had a favorite operation theatre sister who had long silky hair which were pretty, pretty thin. So they would pluck out one hair from our head, wind it over a gauze piece, boil it, thread it into a needle and use that. After a few days, the sister started getting scared. Sir, you will make me bald. <laughs> so as a great allowance, they said, all right, tomorrow, whatever hair comes in your comb, when you comb it, bring those along. For years, this used to be the practice. Then, absorbable material came from the guts. Gomic cat gut. And now we have come to white ring and other materials. These are absorbable, non-absorbable. The next era, the revolution occurred when Sir Harold Ridley was operating at the St. Thomas's Hospital in 1950. As he removed the cataract, one of the students behind him asked, aren't you going to put something in? And that heralded and made him think that, yes, we can put this and try if it works like an intraocular lens implant. The first implants were like heavy marbles. They rolled in the eyes and they destroyed the endothelium and they were a disaster, except for a few who did very well. Any chain is hard at first, messy in the middle and gorgeous at the end when all the difficulties have been ironed out. This was the first lens invented in 1950. The material for the lens came about accidentally. There is so much serendipity in medicine. The fighter pilots in World War II had a canopy over their aircrafts which was made of a transparent plastic material called PMMA. And then the German attack guns used to fire from the bottom. Fragments of this canopy would be embedded into the flesh and bodies of the pilots. And they noticed that this was inert, it was transparent and it had the same refractive index as the human lens. So this was the first material used to make the intraocular lens. Dr. S. M. Cooper, our teacher's teacher, he was the first to go to England and bring these lenses to India. In 1950, he did almost 30 cases. And when we were residents, we have seen one case with 618 vision after almost uh, 25 to 30 years. It was done with extracapsular surgery and the lens was in place. But most of them used to develop glaucoma and endophthalmitis. The newer lenses are legion. There are more than 500 types of lenses, anterior chamber lenses, iris supported lenses and posterior chamber is the most frequently done nowadays. Daljit Singh's claw lens was very popular initially and he was a surgeon who was
famous for using steel sutures which were twist with one single throw and they were inert. This lens was originally designed by John Wurst and Daljit Singh modified it to make the gaps in the lens at 10 and 2 o'clock rather than 3 and 9 o'clock. But because this was on an iris which was mobile with the movements of the eyeball, it would strike the corneal endothelium and cause ullus keratopathy. And it was nicknamed the worst lens of sin. Many have had to be explanted, including the steel sutures. These are some of the various lenses which have come in. The one on the lower last one is the Lysky lens, which is the first one which I have used in KEM because it used to be a fixed diameter and it had to be measured from white to white and the lens had to be one millimeter less than the white to white diameter. Binkost used these lenses which were pupillary supported. If you dilated the pupils to see the fundus, many of them went into the vitreous. Fyodor from Russia was the first to develop the Sputnik lens. And they asked him, suppose the lens goes into the vitreous, what do you do next? And he replied, you take a swig of vodka and put another one in. <laughs> that time they did not remove the lenses with red them. These are some of the ones. The Kelman one is the most widely used even today. Now the changes have occurred. We are going in for multifocal lenses, accommodative lenses, and monovision, trifocals, and special forms of lenses. They have lenses which can reduce the photophobia for aniridia. There are drug eluting IOLs which are soaked in blood and uh, certain drugs and they go inside. Internal contact lenses and piggyback lenses are also for correcting eye myopia. Some lenses can adjust their power by using light after they have been implanted inside. Research is also going on to remove the cataract and insert a liquid to get an accommodative IOL. Low visual aids like telescopic IOLs are inserted in the eye. Many forms of capsulectomies have been devised. Kratz was the first to do the can opener. And then came the era of the Foucault emulsification. Charles Kelman is the father of Peco emulsification. The interesting story. He had been funded by a research group to develop a machine for removing the uh, lens mechanically. It was a three-year project. He made many devices to shatter the lens, but the fragments of the lens during delivery would hit the endothelium and the next day the cornea would be white. He was coming towards the end of the research project. This was the hippie era. He had long hair, bad teeth. So one day he had a haircut and he was ready to face the trustees who had given him money and he had nothing to show for his efforts. He went to the dentist to have his teeth clenched. And at that time there were some cavities. The first time his teeth were drilled without him having pain. So he asked the dentist what he was using and he said it was an ultrasound drill. So he threw off his towel, ran to his lab 
the dentist thought this guy has gone crazy, came back with a cadaver lens. He put it in his palm, uh, palm and he grabbed the probe of the dentist. And this was the first time that the probe went into the nucleus without the lens matter flying in all directions. From then on, they said ultrasound is the way to go. And because it was damaging to the endothelium, the first prototype went into disrepute. And like the intraocular lenses, years later with several modifications, people have now made this the standard procedure. Many stalwarts have come and this is device the continuous curvilinear capsular axis, can opera axis and now the femtosecond laser has come to improve upon the type of axis and even fragment the lens. Utrata forceps was the most universally used forceps for doing the axis. This is the femtosecond which is now used to perform the rexis as well as fragment the nucleus. The new systems use Zepto, which is also like a thermal pottery to get a uniform rexis. In our times, trachoma and many other diseases were treated by very rudimentary and sort of barbarous ways. We had a naps roller forceps and a trachoma rasp. It was like a file and it was rubbed against the palpebral conjunctiva to rupture the follicles and remove the follicles which were irritating and infecting the eye. If there was no conjunctiva, there was no conjunctival follicle. That was the dictum. Steroids were hardly used at that time. And sometimes they were not available. We had resorted to a therapy known as protein shock therapy. In order to induce in the steroid, increase the steroid secretion from the person's own adrenals is to give injection milk. Like through bhaiyas, we used to remove the cream from the top of the bowl of milk and inject 10 cc's intramuscularly. This would produce fever with rigors and the eye would get alright but the patient would limp for two to three weeks. The next drug which was used, like every time we have been vaccinated, we get fever. They used to use injection TAB vaccine, which was injected intravenously, 20 to 30 million units. And this also produced fever. If you are still more sadistic, you would inject 10 cc of the patient's own blood, preferably with a thick, stout and unsterile needle into his bottom. And that, if it got infected, pustules would form, but it would increase his chance of getting fever with right eyes. I'm sorry to say, now all this is history. And we have advanced from there to various Viewing systems, the modern of thermoscope I have seen only in the instrument day before the exams. It was dismembered and the remnants were left for students to decipher what it was used for. It was a concave mirror with a central aperture. Then came the indirect. And Dr. Useka has been the pioneer in teaching all of us that we should first use the indirect before you can have a good uh, retinal examination. 
Meteoric will surgery. You cannot do today's job with yesterday's methods and still hope to be in business tomorrow. In the initial stages, detachments were first treated by stenopic glasses and complete bed rest. The longest known bed rest given to a person has been one and a half years when the detachment settled. The eye has been fried, frozen, sliced and injected with various chemicals. Even Dr. Cooper used to do certain injections under the sclera to produce a chorioretinal adhesion to settle detachments. Jules Boni is the first person who said that the retinal tears were the ones was the cause of the detachment and he tried to seal that by ignipuncture, thermal cautery. When he first did that, he was condemned that this was like using a cannon to shoot sparrows. Initially, there was only puncture diathermy and surface diathermy inside the scleral bed. Then come the implants and with the advent of the cryo came the explants. Percy Amoyles was the one who devised the cryopexy for retinal holes and tears. The scleral buckles, sponges and encircling bands and rods were the next step forward. SRF drainage through a sclerotomy was dreaded because this was the step which caused the maximum number of intraocular bleeds, fibrosis and PVR. Radial sponges caused lots of infections. They also had to be put in a very precise manner so that the tear would be completely covered on all 360 degrees. Encircled was tied either by sutures, the Watsky tube or tantalum clips. Gert Meyer Shukara from Germany has been credited with the discovery of the laser and zero arc photofagulation. His inspiration came when he was in a Russian prison cell and he read Galileo's history. Galileo used to look at the sun and he became blind because of macular burns. That's when Maya Shukara got the idea. Why not harness solar energy or energy from any other light source and use it for coagulating the retina? And over the years, many instruments have come up which have revolutionized retinal surgery with the use of lasers. Initially, macular hole was treated by covering your good eye and asking the person to look at the sun, sun gazing for 10 to 15 minutes every day in order to get a solar burn around the edges of the macular hole to prevent it from getting a retinal detachment in future. They were also photocoagulated, just like the state bank symbol or your tonometer weight, except for the papillomacular boundary. The rest of the circumference of the hole was coagulated, half within the hole and half on the outside, so that this coriotinal adhesion would minimize the chances of a retinal detachment. Dr. Usekar, Dr. Modi, Dr. Maskati and Dr. Adrian Wala were some of the first to use the photocoagulator in KEM. We were the second in the country to have had a Zeiss photocoagulator. And this is the Clinitex Log 3 model. 
which was used like a direct ophthalmoscope. It had tremendous power and we used to use it for destroying retinoblastomas and your vascularizations on the retina. It was more destructive, but it was also far more effective than the current lasers. It was saying that so sonar ki ek luar ki, the clinitex is the luar. Laser delivery systems have changed. First it was the slit lamp only, then came the laser indirect ophthalmoscope and endolaser. Now new modalities have come up where with a single foot switch depression you can get a multitude of spots in various patterns delivered without any skip areas in the middle. This is the Pascal laser. This is the pan retinal photocoagulation and this helps to reduce the incidence of bleeding afterwards. Robert McDermott in Florida was the first to remove the vitreous. He worked in his garage and he took a egg, made a hole in it and put this whisk machine through that hole and sucked out the white of the egg. Ever since then, this has come. Dr. Ursekar was the first to start the whisk procedure in the vitrectomy in KEM using an indirect ophthalmoscope. He was like a nutrat, one leg on the foot switch one hand holding the cutter and one hand holding the 20D lens. And we used to put our heads back and look through the viewing side mirror and manually aspirate the vitreous. He got a backache. He also got a backache. But this was the first vitrectomy which we have been done in KDM. It took 45 minutes to 1 hour to assemble this. It was a single pot vitrectomy. And now we also had a portable vitrector, the Kaufman vitrector, which was kept ready in the formalin chamber. So whenever we had a vitreous loss during cataract surgery, instead of doing an open sky vitrectomy with the wakers, we could use this. Various forms of cutters have changed from oscillating to guillotine. Newer instruments have come to work, forceps, scissors, the new vitrectomy machines with higher speeds. Cutters have reduced in size and thickness, just like the jungle family is women. 20G has given way to 23G. 25G and 27 gauge. The speed of the cutter has gone up. From Jesse Owens to Usain Bolt, the cutting speeds have increased to almost 10,000 times per second. Steve Charles, another great retinal surgeon, has he wore many instruments, this Charles Flute Needle, and he has come to India and taught us. John Scott, the father of silicon oil for internal tamponades, without doing fluid gas exchange, you make a large sclerotomy, point the needle just above the disc, and ask his assistant to screw the silicon oil into the eye. As the silicon oil uh, filled the eye, he would depress on the sclerotomy, let out some fluid and re-inject. And the retina would flatten without doing fluid gas exchange. The thickness has increased from 1000 centistrokes to 5000 and even 10,000. Gases, expansile gases have come into work and these help to produce 
internal tamponades nowadays. Perfluorocarbon first advocated by Stanley Chan. This was the third hand which used to be put in the eye to flatten the PVRs and the only disadvantage is that it had to be removed on table. These are some of the things which you all have to work. Later on in life, you should get a fluid which can be left inside forever. Staining and peeling have now become commonplace for macular hole surgery. I love peeling after staining with brilliant blue and green. Infusion systems have changed. We have 25 gauge, 3 pot vitrectomies as the gold standard. Viewing systems, the new microscopes, xenon light sources, wide angle viewing systems like Biome have increased and improved the outcomes of retinal surgeries. These are some of the dyes which have been used inside during retinal surgery. If you remember our stalwarts, Dr. Ursekar is in the back row, Dr. Maskati is in the front row, third from the left, Dr. D.G. Modi, Dr. S.N. Cooper, Dr. Runanda, Dr. R.J. Patel and many others. Dr. Sutaria is in the end. A more later version, where all of us look much younger. <laughs> you might recognize some of them. Dr. Andrew Nicholson is at the back. Dr. Maskati, Dr. Donanda, Dr. Usekar, Dr. Adrian Walla, and Dr. Y.K. Rastu. These have all helped in molding us and giving us both knowledge and inspiration to carry on. The current situation has changed. We are in the midst of medical legal issues. Never try to run down your colleagues by saying that they have been botched up surgery. You never know when it will backfire on you again. Ursa have always used to tell us to do more through cooperation rather than confrontation. Do not deride the value of the juniors and the paramedical staff. I'll tell one story when we had gone for an eye camp in a rural area. One of the ladies was a primary, elderly primary, about 40 plus, who had just got pregnant. So she was having a very precious child. And there was a bullfight in the village. The people had gathered round to see the fight, including her. One of the bulls with his long sharp horns suddenly got beaten by the other fellow and he came charging straight into this lady's stomach. The horn went in, she got a ruptured uterus and the baby's finger popped out of the uterus. The parents were aghast. They pleaded with the general surgeon in the town that whatever you do, try to save the life of this person as well as the baby. With great repetition, he took up the challenge, they took up the surgery, but try as they may, they could not put the child's finger back into the uterus. The next alternative was to amputate the finger and then suture the uterus. Just then, one of our pan chewing mamas came into the uh, theater and asked, Kai Jala, Kai Jala. And then he was told what has transpired. So he said, Thamba. He went out, got a candle, a matchstick, and agar batti. He lit the candle, burnt the Thing, told the surgeon to move out and he touched the agarbatti on the child's finger and the burn immediately made the child retract his finger and 
save the feedback. Many of our work boys and sisters used to help us before the era of the pulse oximeter and the monitoring. When they were shifting the patient, they would say, Sir, patient thanda chala. And then the resuscitation drill would come in. One sister, when they were doing some endoscopic procedure, ENT surgeon, is telling the ENT surgeon, Sir, tacha dola halte. But the ENT surgeon ignored the warning. And next day they found that they had damaged the optic nerve and the patient had lost sight. So please listen to your juniors, colleagues, subordinates. You can do whatever you like, but at least look at them attentively and respect their views. One other story of Dr. Mascatis, I don't know if it's true, but it's very inspiring. There was a lord in England who had a large estate tended by his gardener. The lord and the gardener both had children. And the boys used to play together as all kids do. The lord detested the friendship between these two boys, but he could do nothing about it because there was no stigma or social strata in a child's world. After some time they went swimming and the Lord's son was drowning. The gardener's son was a better swimmer so he saved this guy's life. The Lord then changed his attitude, called the gardener and said, I am very happy that your son has done this for my kid and in what way can I repay you? The gardener replied, Sir, I am old. If you educate my child, I will be very happy. So, the Lord educated the child. Both of them grew up. The Lord died. The gardener died. Years later, the Lord's son became a politician. And the gardener's son became a doctor. The Lord's son became very sick with pneumonia. He was dying. That's when he remembered his childhood friend, had him placed and called him and said, can you help me? That time, a new drug had just been discovered. He said, if you like, we'll try it. That's not commercially marketed. And he agreed and he got well. The Lord's son was Sir Winston Churchill. The drug was penicillin and the gardener's son was Sir Alexander Fleming. Please be kind to your colleagues, friends, subordinates, everyone. Don't go after wealth. Go after improving your surgical skills and excellence. Give an open, often uh, this honest opinion. There is no substitute for integrity. As Dr. Edinwala always tells, fame is like vapor, riches take wing, the only certainty is oblivion. Be kind to your patients, as they say, you may cure sometimes, but sympathize always. Now it's time to walk into the sunset and give the patent to the next generation who is smarter, brighter, and full of energy and I hope that you succeed in life. Thank you very much. I would like to encourage all the things we have learned from our institution, our teachers, my colleagues, my patients, my family and Dr. Rani Pai who has helped me to prepare this presentation. Thank you.
in the course of these series of talks that we have been privileged to listen to, I have one dominating or dominant regret and that is that so many of these benches are empty. The reason I feel sorry is that all those who could have filled these benches have lost a great opportunity. They've lost the opportunity of listening to somebody who talked with wisdom, with empathy, and with humor. He has taught us so many lessons today. And it's a pity that all these youngsters who could have learned so much from Muni will have lost this great opportunity. Fortunately for us, Dr. Lopa Mehta and her team have arranged to record this entire talk and the slides. And so, I do hope that some of these young students and residents will at least look at the video film and learn from it, if not from the man in flesh and blood. Rui, many, many thanks. I have learned a lot. Thank you. Thank Dr. Rumi Jahangir. Dear Rumi, you did a wonderful job. I also thank all the senior teachers, the chairpersons, and some of the residents who have pulled themselves out of their work, but I am sure you will not regret. By the way, you can pass on this message. This will go on YouTube. All the recordings what we did is put on YouTube. So they can have the benefit of 50 years experience. I also thank the dean, the staff, of Gozumet Alumni Association. A lot of work was behind there on these sessions. Dr. and Mrs. Suhas Maitre who has faithfully recorded this and MNT staff. Please do not go away without having tea, coffee and biscuits which are kept outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>